Pot Stirrer Podcast, where politics, religion, and history collide. And it's not always polite. On Wednesday, February 14th, 2018, 19-year-old Nicholas Cruz allegedly murdered 17 people and injured 16 in a mass shooting at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida. The 17 people killed included 14 students and three staff. Since then, students, parents, and many other Americans have been calling for stricter gun control measures, wanting politicians to do more than simply send along their thoughts and prayers. But are stricter gun control measures really the answer? I am your host, Jay Poole. The Gun Violence Archive has recorded 36 mass shootings defined as a shooting incident where four or more people are either killed or injured since the beginning of 2018. This is as of March 2nd. If this pace continues, we could have 215 mass shootings in 2018. There is no guarantee, though, that the pace will remain the same as mass shooting incidents during the same period in 2017 were much higher than both this year and in the previous year, 2016. But overall, the number of mass shootings in 2017 were actually lower than the previous year. Over the past couple of decades, a number of mass shootings have made the news. And in a society that is extremely polarized politically and socially, it's hard for people to agree on what the problem is, much less the solutions. I've discussed the Second Amendment and gun control in episode 18. This will not be a complete rehash of that episode. This episode today is more of a response to the Parkland school shooting and the climate surrounding the issue. I highly recommend you listen to episode 18 as well as this one to get a fuller picture of my views regarding the Second Amendment and gun control. Like the last couple of episodes, there are some points I may make that will upset both sides of the issue. But I think it's important to talk about these things anyway. And I hope that even if you don't agree with some or all of my thoughts, this episode will give you something to think about. If you've listened to episode 18, or follow me on Twitter, you know I'm somewhat of an anomaly. I'm definitely left of center politically, yet I am pro-Second Amendment. But even as someone who supports the Second Amendment, the teenage students at Stoneman Douglas who are advocating in favor of gun control, along with parents of the victims, give me hope. I'll talk a bit later about my feelings regarding the solutions they are advocating for. But what I do love about this is that in the midst of great tragedy, young people are showing heart and fighting for something that actually matters. Instead of the sad and hateful vision of the future that Charlottesville's Unite the Right Tiki Torch March brought, this is something much more hopeful. Engagement among the young is beautiful, and whether you agree with their solutions or not, fighting to save lives rather than lose them is a noble cause that is, at the very least, worthy of our respect. I don't believe the National Rifle Association, or NRA, caused the Parkland shooting through lobbying and opposition to stricter gun control, but the NRA still deserves every bit of backlash they get, because they have become less of a Second Amendment lobby and more of an arm of the GOP and Trump, as well as the gun manufacturers. Whether Trump actually acts on his talk of gun confiscation or not, Fact is that the NRA stoked the fears of President Obama taking our guns for eight years, which of course was only a boon for those gun manufacturers. Trump may do more to restrict guns than Obama ever dreamed of doing. Yet the NRA is largely silent. They have embraced him with open arms while declaring Americans who don't share in the Trumpian vision their enemies. Wayne LaPierre, Dana Lash, and a lot of them have little interest in the Second Amendment. Just money and power by any means necessary. The NRA is rendering itself functionally obsolete. 
and the chickens have come home to roost. So there are a number of people on the other side of the issue who are framing the what do we do about school shootings question as one that only has one solution, gun control. And what gun control means goes from strengthen background checks to ban semi-automatic weapons or all weapons. There's also the gun show loophole that I will tell you does not exist. And if you don't agree with the strongest of these suggestions, well, you want to see kids die. That narrative is dead wrong. And more than that is a reflection of how divided we have become as Americans. We see the worst in each other instead of listening to each other. And the best solutions to this issue require all of us to share our insight and knowledge and work together. I'll get more into that later. In reading social media and listening to the different sides of the debate over what to do about school shootings and mass shootings in general, a few thoughts came to mind that I'll share here. Removing school-led prayer from schools in the 1960s, or how some frame it, taking God out of public schools, did not cause this. If you think this, your God is small and weak. The God of the Bible is not small and weak, and he requires our obedience and devotion, not our protection. God is everywhere. The idea that simply separating church and state in government-funded schools is pushing God out is absurd. Also, some mass shootings, such as the Charleston, South Carolina, and Sutherland Springs, Texas shootings, happened in churches. Was God not there? We live in a society where local police have a great deal of power over life and death, but no accountability. I've referred to this before as the police state. Our police departments are being increasingly militarized due to grants from the Department of Homeland Security. This is not just under Trump. This has been happening for a long time. And if an officer kills an unarmed civilian or a civilian that is legally armed, that officer can simply say the magic words, I was in fear for my life, and he or she will likely go scot-free. Do we really trust the police, or even our state and federal government, with government officials extorting individuals and companies, look at Delta Airlines in Georgia right now, quid pro quo, and other open corruption without consequences, and these are the guys we want to trust with our safety? I don't know about you, but I sure don't. There's a lot of danger to our society and to our democracy if we allow the government to be the sole arbiter of use of force. We have the Second Amendment for a reason. Some suggestions people have made for avoiding future school shootings include making the schools a hard target, meaning stepping up security, including metal detectors, armed guards, armed veterans, armed police, and even armed teachers. I do think arming teachers is a bad idea because of liability reasons for the schools, and also because it's hard to expect teachers who see their students day in and day out, get to know them, and are a regular part of their lives, to then in a split second be able to shoot these same students if the situation called for it. I have a lot of friends who are teachers. None of the ones I've talked to so far have been in favor of this. People like Trump can talk all day about what they would do. But when a high-stakes, life-or-death traumatic situation happens, there's no way for most of us to know what we would really do. So other than arming teachers, what about making schools a hard target? The arguments I've heard against these added security measures are that it would make the classroom a prison and it puts a band-aid on the problem when the real problem is guns. I came across a list of school shootings that have taken place in the U.S. over the past 50 years from the Pittsburgh Tribune Review. These were shootings that took place in or around K-12 schools. Suicides and shootings when school was not in session were not included on the list. In general, both school shooting incidents and number of deaths have gone up, though it does vary year by year. But what I noticed is that many of the school shootings in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s were in urban schools, big cities like Chicago, D.C., Detroit, L.A., Miami, Dallas, 
But starting around the late 1990s and into the new millennium, suburbs and smaller towns seem to see the bulk of the shootings. The few in urban locations were near the school but not in the school. Why is that? I grew up in the 80s and 90s. I graduated from high school the same year the Columbine shooting occurred, 1999. I cannot relate to those who say that everything changed because of Columbine because it was not my experience. See, in Detroit and in other cities, especially those with high minority populations, armed guards and metal detectors were standard in the public schools. Students at some schools even had to carry clear book bags so their personal effects could easily be seen. While I attended Catholic schools and we did not have metal detectors, we had doors that locked that could only be opened by intercom during the school day, one of the parents patrolled on guard, and if I recall correctly, I believe there were cameras at the doors. And this was all well before Columbine, but this was also in Detroit, Michigan. Meanwhile, the suburban schools, the ones largely free from these security measures, are experiencing the bulk of the shootings within the last 20 years or so. So my question is this. If making schools a hard target has been good enough for city schools the past 20, 25 years, why is it not good enough for suburban schools? And if the issue is that school will be like prison, what does that say about how we view urban schools and the students who attend them? And is the real problem guns at all? Is it semi-automatic weapons? Is it the AR-15? If we're going to say that guns are the problem, knowing what they are is important. Semi-automatic guns, assault weapons, high-powered rifles, these are not interchangeable terms. Most handguns, generally the ones that are not revolvers, are semi-automatic. So your basic pistol, probably semi-automatic. AR-15 and high-powered rifle are not one and the same. Whether or not a rifle is high-powered is relative, though AR-15s are generally not that compared to other types of rifles that don't make the news. AR stands for Armalite, not Assault Rifle, and the AR-15 has been made for civilian use since the 1960s, with versions of it being commercially produced by multiple companies since Colt's patent expired in 1977. While the Federal Assault Weapons Ban restricted the AR-15 and similar guns between 1994 and 2004, the ban did not have a clear impact on gun violence overall during the period it was in effect, according to a review by the National Research Council. In short, the rise in school shootings cannot be blamed on the existence of the AR-15 or any other gun on the civilian market. And banning guns, or the bad guns, does not necessarily guarantee they will not be readily available for those who want to do violence with them. Look at the opioid crisis. Heroin is illegal, has been for a long time, yet it is still readily available for people who want to use it. We need to understand that even if we did ban guns, the rate of gun violence will never be to zero. And even if this were the case, mass violence can and does occur in the U.S. and all over the world with other weapons besides guns. I believe that making schools harder targets, like airports or government buildings, strengthening background checks so that domestic violence and other violent crime can be pulled up even if it's a misdemeanor, funding mental health services for children and adults, and making it more readily available and affordable, and our authorities taking seriously threats on social media and elsewhere, will all help decrease the rate of school shootings and other gun violence. But I believe that much of the rise in school shootings can be tied to our relationship to each other as Americans. There does not appear to be any indication the Parkland shooting was racially or ethnically motivated, but the shooter was known by other students to have white supremacist leanings and spent a lot of time online spewing hatred of blacks and Muslims. So while his killing spree did not target these groups, this massacre shows that hate not properly addressed is a danger to everyone. 
Political scientist Robert Putnam wrote a book called Bowling Alone in 2000 based on an article he wrote in 1995. And in it, he discusses how social capital has declined since the 1950s. Social capital is a form of economic and cultural capital in which social networks are central, transactions are marked by reciprocity, trust, and cooperation, and market agents produce goods and services not mainly for themselves, but for a common good. Putnam argues that social relationships and routine social interaction has declined, including a decline in membership in social clubs, unions, volunteer organizations, civic groups, and fraternal organizations. He makes the case that without interactions in these social settings, civic discussions are less likely to occur. Social capital declines, leading to a decline in active civic engagement, which is required for a strong democracy. In the present, this theory can give us something to think about. When we craft laws and other strategies to reduce gun violence, we need to have an understanding of what we're actually doing and if it will do what we hope it will while still maintaining our democracy. For that, we need both sides working together. Believe it or not, we need each other. But unfortunately, we live in a society that is increasingly separated while giving the illusion of community. We are much more easily able to individualize our time. We look at the news that best aligns with our views. We craft our social media feeds so only the opinions we agree with bleed through. And we simply unfriend people on Facebook we've known in real life for years because they voted for the wrong person last year. Many of us don't even know our neighbors' names, much less spend any time talking to them. Interacting with people different from ourselves in background, culture, life experience, and thought in a meaningful way, and mirroring that for our children helps us to be able to deal with conflict and confrontation in a healthy manner. Are there absolutes? Of course. But even when there is an objective right and wrong, it is always important to understand other people. We can't reach them if we don't get them. And if we are isolating ourselves, we don't give ourselves a chance to truly work on empathy. If we as a society are demonizing others within our society, or even our newcomers, because they look differently, speak differently, believe differently, think differently, that permeates through our society and trickles down to the next generation. Not every person in society will have the impulse control or mental fortitude to not act out on their feelings. The human brain does not finish developing until around age 25, and empathy is among the last mental abilities to develop. Too many of us Americans see each other as the enemy, and that tendency is absorbed by the next generation, but without the mental maturity to stop themselves from reacting violently towards one's enemies. People that treat us well, we treat them well. People that treat us badly, we treat them much worse than they can ever imagine. That's the way it has to be. That's the way it has to be. Check out our website today, hotswearpodcast.com, for previous episodes, special presentations, announcements, merch, and all things Potstirer Podcast. You can find our show on iTunes, Google Play, and most other podcatchers. If you enjoy the show, please subscribe, give us five stars, leave a review, share, and tell your friends. Thank you for listening and supporting Potstirer Podcast. I'm Jay Poole. Let's fight for America's future because freedom is not free.